Thank you so much for being here, for your study, for your practice, for your support. We're almost at a thousand subscribers, so please don't forget, if you haven't yet, yes, like the videos, that helps the algorithms, but subscribing puts us in a different ballpark so people could find us, number one, and uh, possibly... I don't know. There's not much revenue to be made off YouTube anymore. They've whittled that down to the big, almost corporate concerns now. So I'm not so much worried about YouTube as a <laughs> as an engine of revenue. I'm just wanting to appease the algorithm gods so that this channel pops up on searches more easily so more people can find us. We need to expand our Sangha. We need to promote this practice. Here's why I'm thinking this, especially this morning. There is a person flying a twin-engine Cessna all over the skies around uh, here uh, in this region, uh, Tupelo, Faulkner, Ripley, all around this area. Uh, I believe he's below the 200-foot ceiling. He or she, I don't even know, threatening to crash the plane into population centers like a super center, a Walmart. Um, you know, I come from a time uh, in, as a kid, as a teenager, as a young adult, when uh, unilaterally everyone would have commented, this guy's crazy. What's he doing? He must be off his rock or he's on drugs or she's on drugs. But I think the reality, uh, especially in the last two decades, especially in this decade, um, I think we've all, whether we, everybody discusses it differently. But seriously, the reality is social media, regular media, all of the voices, pictures on your phone, on your TV, on, on the radio, sensationalism, negativity, it's clickbait. It, people are making, corporations, not people, are making tons of money and people working for those corporations are making tons of money lying and promoting the worst possible version of everything. It may have a kernel of truth. There may be actually something happening. But the way it will be discussed will be rhetoricized into hell because of the simple greed of human nature to look upon spectacles, specifically tragedy, right? Actually, this will sound terrible, but people are less concerned about this person going through obviously some kind of terrible mental duress, most likely a depression of sorts. And the only reason they'd be watching for more than a few seconds is the impending disaster. Okay, I'm tired of following this person flying around. Show me the crash. Show me the devastation. Show me the loss of life. My friends, it is not...
the most laudable aspect of human nature, is it? And I'm saying it's our nature. I'm also saying that the mechanisms of corporate greed and money understand that that's a very visceral lizard brain activity and that the social media engine, as well as the regular media, even before social media, had learned to tap into that lizard brain function in sitcoms, in day-to-day -day pro reality shows. My goodness, what is that? It's constant human tragedy, the spectacle of our worst behaviors. Isn't it fun? Well, it's fun when it makes money pour in for your advertisers all want to advertise on it. Oh, it's, you see, my own life condition is being affected talking about it. So I don't want to talk about it a whole lot more, but I do want to identify it because all of us, you and I, have moments, have maybe days. You get caught up in a funk, to put it lightly. And uh, being so admired in it constantly, 24-7, especially with uh, these handy devices. Come on out of the bag for crying out loud. It's no time to be shy. Yes, I talk to inanimate objects. But these things, these, these infernal machines, for all of their potential benefit, you know, the media engine, the, the clown circus of our worst natures have completely taken it over. So back to this channel and the algorithms, we need an outlet. We need to refocus our minds. We need to solidify our Buddha nature, our wondrous amazing humanness, our gracious divine selves, which are there all the time. But we have to remain undistracted by this immense engine of enterprise that preys on our lack of confidence. Because what I'm saying to you is depression, funk, negativity, lashing out, anger. It comes from feeling weakened. It comes from a lack of confidence. How can we build our confidence? What task could we accomplish that would make us feel our self-reward? Something that's not taught in schools anymore. Critical thinking, long gone. But the idea that simply applying your skills, applying your attention to build skills, is in itself rewarding. See, that concept is so alien today. Not reward as in another bite of cheese, not reward as into I've got more than them or her or him. It's not about possession. It's about development. And confidence is developed. So how do we develop confidence? You know the answer. You all know the answer because you do it, you practice. Namu Myoho Renge Kyo is the invocation, the act on the freight train of energies, your karma, that act of enlightenment, of maximal potential. That is the fundament of what 
confidence is. Chant, my friends. Practice. Take care of your altar. Keep it clean. Enshrine with dignity your mandala, free of other distractions. Turn your phone off. Put it on airport mode. Make your entire focus this tool, this mandala, so that it can pierce into your own Gohamzan mind and instantiate your, your greatest potential. Now, 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 Namo Myorengeko, Namo Myorengeko, Namo Myorengeko. Lift your humanity, your confidence, so that when you walk away from your Buddhadan, when you walk away from your Gongyo, when you walk away from your tool of enlightenment, your actual presence, of Buddhaness, it can stay with you. The confidence of it can stay with you. So that as this deluge of negativity comes to greet you, you may even not see it. It may not come to you because there's not a willing subject here to go, yeah, give me some misery. Because you won't be in that life condition. And without knowing it, you will repel it. Some will get through because it's everywhere now. This is the age of degeneration. This is Mapple. Shakyamuni knew this 3,000 years ago. He knew this was coming. Nitrin, in the midst of it, in the beginning of this age, said, oh, here it is. Here's what it looks like. Here's why I have to disassemble all this propaganda of bullcrap around us. Understand that this is how we must practice now. And that the simplest way, the easiest way, the most immediate way that we can simply leave it behind and give ourselves renewed confidence. Namo myoho it doesn't get any easier than that. It's direct. It's immediate. Here's some tools to help you even grasp it more quickly. W using your earthly senses, pull that lizard mind away from all those distractions and go, here it is, Buddhaness. Namo myoho rengekyo. This is an active meditation. A focused realization there is no other methodology for doing this there simply isn't for immediate perfect enlightenment no way you won't find it there's a lot of rituals out there and uh, you know all kinds of magical mystical tours those just end up in this age you know, maybe 3,000 years ago, they might have sparked insights. But these days, they're just another app. They're just another entertainment. They don't get to the root of the precious moment of life. They don't. They're preoccupied with obsessions, obtainment. I had an artist friend, she's passed away now. She used to call, she would gather all sorts of stuff to make her artworks. And she called that warehouse of stuff that she'd collected, Obtainium. <laughs> uh, I miss her sometimes. So the message being, if you're feeling down, if you're feeling You know, when you start going down that path of maybe it starts with doubt and then you th you just don't think you can climb out of it. This guy's in a plane flying around threatening to kill hundreds of people. 
How miserable must this person feel? And, and it's in the intent, isn't it? His attitude, her attitude, very depressed, very, the world is a mess. I don't want to be here anymore. We've all been there. But this one, he's feeling it very, very, very intently. And so this is the nature of negativity. This is the nature of depression is it's not only about self. This is the hell, the world of hell of attachment. And the world of hell has within it rage. Rage comes from that dire helplessness. And because we're social animals, that self-hatred it morphs into victimization. And so that hatred has to come from outside. So this person is blaming all of humanity for the shitstorm he or she is experiencing. Answer, it's not good enough to just kill myself. I have to kill myself with the last honorable act. Take out a few of them bad people with me. Because they're all worthless. Whatever. You know, to the Christians for a very long time, it was Jews. Oh man, he said it out loud. Yeah, it's true. For Muslims, it's Christians. For, for Republicans, it's Democrats. For Democrats, it's MAGA. For the, you can go on and on and on choosing sides. It's ridiculous. Because it's... The fantasy writing, the celebrity, the, the, the notoriety, the, all the naming conventions are about putting an identity to what you feel is most responsible for your lack of confidence. That's what it comes down to. That's why in Buddhism, who's your enemy? Those thoughts, not what you're thinking about. Those thoughts are your enemy. Because they're all constructed. They're not real. But boy, the emotions we experience from those thoughts are real. We have to build our confidence. And our confidence has to be of a nature that is impeccable, non-reproachable. Otherwise, it too can be influenced by the mess. Namo myoho renge kyo. And if we want to change our environment, we have to change us. And the more us there is, the more the environment ameliorates. It has to happen. But it will only happen with our efforts, my friends. Namo myoho renge kyo. That's why we have to make this practice known to more people. Get more people interested in the possibility that they don't have to be miserable all the time. I get tired of hearing the word happy. It's, it too is a marketing tool. So how do we promote Namo Myoho Renge Kyo, Lotus Sutra Buddhism, yeah? By being it, by being it, by responding to people's constant negativity with joy, nurturing, laughter, La don't get drawn in. Oh, I know it's easier said than done. I know that. But if your confidence is high, you won't get drawn in. You won't have to even figure out how do I not get drawn in? See, food, it's everywhere. Chant. Keep your life condition confident, high, focused on the amazement of life. See, then that negativity, it doesn't touch you. It doesn't penetrate. It's just curious. <laughs> you need to stop thinking that way. 
By articulating it, you are making it so. So, let's talk about ice cream. Some people will think you're nuts. So be it. At some point, perhaps when they're especially low, they'll want to taste your ice cream. <laughs> or maybe they'll start coming out of a funk and they'll think, you know, that, that friend of mine always seems to have a comeback that sometimes pisses me off because they're so damn positive. I hate it. <laughs> well, maybe they know something. Maybe, maybe I should figure out what they know. You have no idea how you will influence minds in your environment, but you are. Whether you participate and let them influence you, as I say all the time, our possessions are not things we own. Our possessions are those things that own us. So let your ownership be buddhaness, enlightenment. Let others grasp that. That's propagation. All right. Blah, 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 blah. Let's get to the topic at hand. Let's hear more Shakyamuni's storytelling gifts on how we might understand this uh, incredible process of mind, yeah? Oh, yes. He's right now, he's trying, this thought is pervading this group of monks. And this thought is a Buddhist thought. And everyone is concerned about Virmalakirti, who's ill. And they all know they should go and check up on him. But each one of these people has had a story where they've felt doubt in themselves. Wow, I didn't realize how good a fit this was to my earlier rant. It was not planned. But yeah, each one of these people whose the thought occurs, I should go check on Vimala Kirti, immediately concentrates on something that Virmala Kirti did of great value, but sees themselves as lesser, their confidence wanes. And so they don't think they rate going to check up on Virmala Kirti. What a sad, deluded state of mind that is. And these are not just your average Joes, these are accomplished monks. Consider this. So now think this is Shakyamuni telling this story. Now the lesson Shakyamuni is trying to offer you and I becomes very clear. The nature of our ego is so omnipotent that it would keep us from a very, very simple decision. Just go be loving. Just go be supportive. Hell, what's wrong with going and being supportive to somebody you, you think, even if you think of them as superior to you? How is your buddhaness, your love, your true nature any less valuable to them? Any of you in your 30s go back and visit your old high school to greet, shake the hand of uh, an important, there's always one or two teachers that stand out as really formative in your character. Any of you go back and visit? I did. Those teachers sparkle with life when they, the moment they see you. Suddenly, they're human. They're not teachers, right? How easily we forget that. We stay in the mythology place. So let's go on. Let's, let's see. This is going to get repetitive, but this lesson, he's really hammering this home. 
You must go visit Vimalakirti and inquire about his illness. Now he's talking to Mahakashyapa. But Mahakashyapa replied to the Buddha, World Honored One, I'm not competent to visit him and inquire about his illness. How are you not competent? All right, let's hear it. Why? Uh, let me tell you why. There's that wonderful word, why. Let me justify my sloth. Yeah, I'm being severe, but that's what Buddha is pointing out. You're just being lazy. And in so doing, you're being really vicious. You're holding back your loving kindness, your support to somebody who you say you respect and admire. Because why? Well, because I recall how in the past I was begging for alms in a poor, poor village. Right, because that was the process of the day. Monks were not fed by being merchants. Right, they were fed through the support of the people for their study and their spiritual enlightenment. In that they would share it with the community. So this was the relationship. The community would offer food, or methods for food, or or clothing, or like Reggie here with the candle burning behind me any way they could to support the efforts of the monks, bringing, hopefully, enlightenment to the community. At that time, Virmalakirti approached and said to me, uh, Makashapa, you have a mind marked by compassion and pity, but you do not know how to apply it to all alike. Instead, you shun the rich and mighty and beg alms among the poor. Well, there's the freaking nutshell right there, isn't it? Virmala Kirti saw it, boom, clear as daylight. Maka, Mahakashapa is walking around the town doing the very traditional thing that monks do with his bowl, looking for any kind of sustenance to keep his practice going. But he harbors in his mind that certain people should support him, other people might support him, and some people, well, you just don't approach those people. Why? Is the handful of rice you're going to get from a rich man any different than the handful of rice you're going to get from a poor person? Remember, the caste system in India really reinforces this all the time, right? So obviously, Mahakashapa is walking around town with his bowl with this attitude that I can approach this person, but I probably shouldn't approach that one. How? What he's supposedly practicing is buddhaness. And what he's supposed to be coursing as a bodhisattva is free of those definitions of rich, poor, smart, stupid, foul, whatever. What he's practicing is above all of that terminology, if you understand above, to be disconnected from. Yeah? Buddhaness doesn't care what clothes you wear. It's a maximal state of life, of knowing, of experience, we're all the same mechanism. You, me, my little dog, the trees, we're all the same process of life. Now, you might argue, silly, you can't take your alms bowl and beg from a tree. Although, why not? Maybe you would get fruit from that tree. <gasps> See, you didn't think of that. Because we have these borders, these artificial constructed borders we create in our minds. That's samsara, baby. <laughs> but that's exactly what we're eschewing, pushing away. So why would Mahakashyapa, a high, highly intelligent, highly respected, highly educated practitioner, of Shakyamuni's teachings, 
Now, get this. Now, as is usually the case, we're not very good at analyzing ourselves, typically. But how, how well we can see other people's foibles and, and flaws and, and talents. We're really good at observing others, right? So, Virmala Kirti comes up to Mahakashyapa and says, uh, you need an attitude adjustment. Mahakashyapa is like, oh, what? <laughs> I'm discovered. I don't even know what it is about me. I've been discovered. Virmala Kirti seems to see it. Uh, so he's off his balance, right? Mahakashapa, you must abide by the principle of equanimity and in that spirit go about begging for food. Don't typecast everyone. You're looking for sustenance. You should be looking for any avenue to attain it. Free of your judgment, your, your practice of Enlightenment is no less important to the rich man than to the poor. If you don't understand that, then what are you practicing? What are you, right? Virmala Kirti, because in the end, there is no such thing as eating. In that spirit, one goes about begging for food. It's the attitude and the intent. It's the process. It's always that in Buddhism. Because one wishes to destroy dependence on things characterized by a mere combination of elements, in that spirit one accepts these balls of foodstuff. Because in the end there is no receiving, in that spirit one receives this food. It's not that you're gaining something to possess. Is that you're offering an opportunity for this communication of benevolence between yourself and the community. Maybe don't use the word begging. Maybe it's a translation problem. Firmly Kirti continues, When you enter a village, think of it as an empty village. The forms you see there should appear as they would to a blind man. The sounds you hear should be mere echoes. The, ar the aromas you inhale should be so much thin air. The flavors you taste should be undifferentiated. Oh, there's flavor. Is it sweet? Is it sour? Who cares? There's flavor. Your sense is awakened. Accept all sensations in accordance with the enlightenment of wisdom, the Buddha mind. And understand that all phenomena are no more than phantom forms. This is just our immersion in the process of life. We, we get to play in the river. That's all. They have no intrinsic nature, nor do they take on any other nature. Or, according to another interpretation, intrinsically they have never been on fire and hence will never burn out. The character Jan can mean either so or thus or to burn. Okay. Makashapa, if, without casting aside the eight errors, you can enter into the eight emancipation if, while possessing the marks of error, you can enter the correct law, Buddha mind, Myoho Renge Kyo. If with one meal you can feed all beings, offering alms to the Buddha and the sages and worthy persons, then after that you may eat your food. It, this is all conversation around attitude and intent. What is your intent in begging? Is it simply to feed yourself? Or is it to have this holistic 
into relationship of equanimity. And yeah, there's a feeding part for this vessel, but it's the Buddha mind that you're feeding, that you're allowing to expand, be shared. Hmm. One who eats in this manner neither possesses earthly desires nor is separated from earthly desires, neither enters into a meditative state of mind nor arises out of such a state, neither dwells in this world nor dwells in nirvana. This is the hat trick of our practice of Buddhism. With a Buddha mind, unattached, we, this apparatus, courses through this life as a bodhisattva, constantly maintaining the equanimity of a Buddha mind while at the same time interacting in all of the various ways with all of the various things without obsession, without obtaining, without losing. It's always about attachment. Desire is attachment. Attachment is desire. One who gives alms in this matter neither derives neither great fortune nor little fortune, neither profit nor loss, right? Gaining or losing. This is the correct way to enter the Buddha way without relying on the path of the voice hearer who thinks he is owed. I hear the teachings and that makes me want, that's entitlement, not enlightenment. You see the difference? Mahakashyapa, if you can eat your food in this manner, then you will not be eating in vain the food that others give you. Because the symbolism of it, the attitude of it, the intent of it, will be far and away much more important to what is actually happening than the rice or the peanut butter and jelly or, or, or the candle, right? At that time, World Honored One, when I hear, heard him speak these words, I gained what I had never gained before. And I was inspired with a profound respect for all the bodhisattvas. Oh, good, you got the message. Now you know what it is to course in the world as a bodhisattva. It's all about attitude and intent. Yeah. And I thought to myself, if this householder, there he is going right back to his habit. If this householder possesses such eloquence and wisdom that can, he, he can speak like this, then who could listen to him without being moved to set his mind on the attainment of Anuttara Samyak Sambodai? From that time on, I ceased to urge others to follow the path of the voice hearer or the Parachyaka Buddha. That is why I say I'm not competent to visit him and inquire about his illness. He has no need for me. I'm just a stupid monk. I don't even know how to be a good bodhisattva. And he's just, you know, he's not even a monk. Well, there's your problem, Mahakashyapa. You're doing it again. Who cares if he's wealthy or a householder or where he comes? Monk, being a monk is being a resolute student. Just because he doesn't have a stamp on his forehead or the club you belong to doesn't make him any, doesn't make him any more or less. You still don't get it. But that's still not a reason. It's a reason why you're holding back. You found a really good one. You don't merit. But it's completely constructed bullshit. You didn't get the lesson. The Buddha then said, Subhuti. <laughs> he doesn't even argue with him. Okay. Because again, this is the mind of the people. This isn't. But in this story, Shakyamuni is saying, okay. I'll give up on you then. Wait, would the Buddha do that? No. But the example of the story is how devious the ego is. So then he turns to Subhuti. 
Subhuti is just another one of the senior monks there who has the same thought occur to him. You must go visit Vimalakirti and inquire, inquire about his illness. What do you think Subhuti said? I know you know. He replies to the Buddha, World honored one, I am not competent to visit him and ask about his illness. Okay. Why? Let me give you my justification. Because I recall how in the past when I went to his house to beg for arms, oh, unlike Mahakashyapa, Subhuti wasn't afraid to go to the wealthy man's householder man house and ask and beg for alms. So good on you, Subhuti. At that time, Virmanakirti took my begging bowl, filled it with things to eat, and said, Ah, Subhuti, if one can look on all foods as equal, that person can look on all things as equal. And if one can look on all things as equal, one will look on all foods as equal. If one begs alms in this manner, then one is worthy to receive food. He's giving you a compliment, Subhuti. What's your problem? Subhuti, if you cannot cut yourself off from lewdness, anger, and stupidity, and yet not be a part of these, if you can refrain from destroying the idea of a self and yet see all things as of a single nature, if without wiping out stupidity and attachment, you can find your way to understanding and freedom from attachment, if you can seem to be a perpetrator of the five cardinal sins and yet gain emancipation, if you can be neither unbound nor bound, neither one who has perceived the four noble truths nor one who has not perceived them, neither one who obtains the fruits of practice nor one who does not obtain them, neither a common mortal nor one who has removed himself from the ways of common mortal, neither a sage nor not a sage, if in this manner you can master all phenomenal things and yet remove yourself from the ways that mark them, then you will be re, uh, 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 worthy to receive food. So Virmalakirti is just expounding further on that teaching of understanding what we are. That we are keen observers of the process of life. So that at once we are a pair of eyes and mechanisms to perceive this process of life, be great partakers of that process of life, but without feeling attached to the various mechanisms and things of life. Course within life in all of its expressions, good, bad, middle, whatever, without being influenced, just being observers. And in a way, Virmalakirti is just extending further. He wants Subhuti, in a way, to say, look, you weren't, you know, um, what's the word? You had no prejudice in coming to my door to beg for alms. You simply were doing the act of begging for alms to support your practice and the community in one exchange. You didn't care that I was wealthy. You didn't care that, it, or I wasn't wealthy. This is the presumption of the story. Now, extrapolate that act. Do you really know what you're, what you're actually doing? Because it's incredibly valuable. Make this lesson toward all things you do. Behave in this way in all things. So Virmalakirti is just congratulating him and exerting, exhorting him to apply this kind of being in all matters. It's quite substantial, isn't it? He went on, Subhuti, if without seeing the Buddha or listening to his law, you are willing to take those six heretical teachers, Paruna, Kashyapa, Maskarin, Goshiliputra, Sanjajin, Vairatiputra, Ajita, all these people, 
as your teachers leave the household life because of them and follow them in fail, uh, falling into the same errors they fall into, then you will be worthy to receive food. So really, that's poorly crafted translation. What Vimer Lakirti, in following his previous paragraph, is saying is that if you could be amongst all of these delusions and attachments and teachers with all their foibles and so forth without being influenced or attached by them, staying clear of those influences while coursing th through and with them, then you are worthy to receive food. Because the receiving of food isn't about feeding your stomach. It's about the support for your enlightenment and that enlightenment shared bodhisattva way back at the community. The food is going both ways in different form. Subhuti, if you can subscribe to erroneous views and thus never reach the other shore of enlightenment, if you can remain among the eight difficulties and never escape from difficulty and can make common cause with earthly desires and remove yourself from a state of purity, if when you attain the samadhi of non-disputation you allow all living beings to attain the same degree of concentration, if those who you give who give you alms are not dis destined to gain good fortune thereby, and those who make offerings to you fall into the three evil paths of existence, if you are willing to join hands with the host of devils and make the defilements your companion, if you can be no different from all these devils and these dusts and defilements, if you can bear hatred toward all living beings, slander the Buddhas, vilify the law, not be counted among the assembly of monks, and in the end, never attain nirvana. If you can do all this, then you will be worthy to receive food. He didn't say adopt their thinking. He didn't say become one of them. He said to withstand. As today, as I started this video, this podcast, we are in a world of defilements, constantly barraged by negative enticements. How many big pharma commercials did you see today? <sighs> on and on and on and on and on. Can you remain disconnected in your Buddhaness? while remaining here within the derision, defilements, the enticements, be unaffected by them. And more than unaffected, be so focused on what is amazing about life, your buddhaness, that it just becomes noise. Can you do that? At that time, World Honored One, when I heard these words, I was dumbfounded. <laughs> yeah. Not knowing what sort of words they were or how to answer them. It didn't quite, it was so profound. I put down my alms bowl intending to leave the house, but Vermela Kirti said to me, Ah, Sabudi, pick up your alms bowl and do not be afraid. Why do I say this? If some phantom person conjured up by the thus come one were to reprimand you as I have just done, you would not be afraid, would you? No, I replied. Virmalakirti said, all things in the phenomenal world are just such phantoms and conjured beings as I constantly remind us. Everything we perceive is a construction. Right? So you have no cause to feel afraid. They're phantoms. They're not real in the sense that life is real. 
their constructions, their emotional baggage, their, their influences, their car commercials. Why? Because all these words and pronouncements, too, are no different from those of other phantom forms. When a person is wise, and we're talking about Buddha wisdom here, he does not cling to words and hence is not afraid of them. Where have we heard this before? Why? Because words are... Now what's happening? Why? Because words are something apart from self-nature. Words do not really exist. They're constructions. And this is emancipation. All things of the phenomenal world bear this mark of emancipation. When Virmala clearly expounded the law in this manner, 200 heavenly beings gained the purity of the Dharma eye. Therefore, I say, I am not competent to visit him and ask about his illness. What a strange thing to say. Consider this. It cannot be avoided by this point in, in reading this sutra that Virmila Kirti is restating almost word for word Shakyamuni's teachings in previous sutras. There are words in this sutra that you'll hear again in the Lankavatara and many other places. The whole thing about finger pointing at the moon, the words, don't be so hooked up on the words, look for the meaning. Virman Kirti is restating this again. So once again, understand this is an expedient means. This isn't a novella on, on the FX network. This isn't a picture, is, you know, and even that is a constructed story, right? Virmala Kirti is not a real person. He's a personage. And in this case, he's a personage of Shakyamuni Buddha. And so it's interesting that he's using this personage. Look, Subhuti, you won't accept this lesson from me without all sorts of karmic obfuscation around it. Let me put this story in somebody else, a wealthy man who you just see as a wealthy man, as a householder in Vasadi. And yet from him, these words bowl you over, but you'll quickly run to me for the same advice. Where's the disconnect here? What are you not understanding? See, this idea is still haunting all of these monks that Shakyamuni is the Buddha and all of them are just running around trying to do what he says. But Virmala Kirti is a man who's teaching them what Buddha is trying to teach them, their own Buddha mind, and telling them, act like a Buddha. And they're going, whoa, who are you? And they're not understanding that all of this is a mental conversation happening in their own mind. Their own ego wrestling with enlightenment and actually actively prohibiting it. And so it's no wonder they're all saying the same thing. I'm not worthy. Well, but that's the lesson over and over again is you are worthy. Just act it. Be it. We haven't gotten to the Lotus Sutra yet where that's made obvious. Hmm. Interesting sutra, isn't it? From our perspective, at least. How it was understood at that time? Is there any value in knowing that? Uh, no. What's happening is here and now. Namo Myo Rengekyo. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Take care of your health. Be kind to yourself. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your constant practice and study. It takes courage and you're amazing for it. Stay focused. I will see you in the next one.
Bye for now.